Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to people about their stories with VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and related vascular and aortic connective tissue conditions. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in this podcast are those of the individuals involved, and the information presented does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Any opinions that I express in this podcast are my own and not of my employer. In the last episode, we talked to Michelle Lucena about her experience with VEDS, or Vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Today, we're talking to Lauren Atherton about her experience with Lois Dietz syndrome, including the aortic dissection that led to her diagnosis. Let's get into the show. Hey, Lauren, thank you so much for coming on to the show to share your story with Lois Dietz syndrome. I'm so excited that you're coming on to share your story. It's been awesome working with you professionally for a little while while I was at the VEDS movement. And now to just call you a friend is awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to share a little bit about my journey with Louis Dietz syndrome and have fun for the next 40 minutes. (laughs) Yes. Do you want to introduce yourself to people who don't know you already? Absolutely. I'm Lauren Atherton. I... Um, was diagnosed with Lewis Dietz syndrome in 2017. When I was 28 years old, I actually had an emergency aortic dissection. And surprise, surprise, after genetic testing, I actually found out I had Lewis Dietz syndrome. And so I live in Colorado with my husband, Brett, and our two dogs and own my own business. And so it's really been rewarding to see how life changes if you just allow it to kind of change and flow with life rather than try to resist it. But yeah, yeah, excited to share more about my journey with Lois Dietz syndrome and uh, how it's changed since I've even been diagnosed. I've been known I had Lois Dietz syndrome for six years now. And so definitely in the beginning was more of a shock. And then now it's like, okay, how do I live with this thing that's not what I ex- expected or wanted at all? <laughs> yeah, for real. Let's start with the aortic dissection. Because at that point, you're 28 years old, and you don't know anything about Lois Dietz syndrome, right? Yes. Yeah. And no history in my family, no history of any heart trouble, heart disease, nothing on the radar. And so I, my husband and I were just married <laughs> for six months. I actually had, uh, my mom was in town the week before, like felt totally normal. The day before my aortic dissection, I actually got the opportunity to join a friend of mine who does social media for the Denver Broncos to be on the field and like helping him capture content, which was like once in a lifetime opportunity. But when like in hindsight, everything's crystal clear, right? But like, as you're going through it, it's like, oh, that's weird. Hmm. That's strange. Like you'd not really, at least I wasn't like, I'm 28 and healthy. Everything is normal. But in hindsight, you know, when we got below the stadium, I felt this pop and like a pressure change. And that's all I can really equate it to. Like, it was just the most bizarre feeling. And I remember turning to my friend and be like, did you feel that? Like, is there, like, I thought maybe there's pressurized something below the stadium. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Again, in hindsight, those are signs in women of an aortic dissection. (laughs) And so I'm like, where is the pop? Like, where, where did you feel that? It was in my jaw. So it was like my my jaw and in my throat, it actually felt like I had like, an egg in my mouth, if that makes sense. It was just a weird, bizarre feeling that I was like, that's weird. And then I started getting a pounding headache. And so, um, again, in hindsight, I had had migraines for years and I always had excited migraine with me. Excited migraine speeds your heart up. That's how you kind of get over the caffeine in it helps you feel better. And I didn't have it with me that day. And I don't know what would have happened if I had it with me. I mean, just Again, all the pieces come together when you're looking back on a situation as you're going through it. I'm like, dang it, how did I not pack that, you know? Um, so anyway, so spent the day on the field, like had 
pain between my shoulder blades. I wasn't feeling great, but I'm like, this is once in a lifetime. I have to be here. Went home the next day. I was at home again. I work from home and own my own business. So that was nice being able to just rest and take breaks when I didn't feel well. But I fainted twice. And then I called my husband and was like, hey, just so you know, I fainted, but I'm just going to lay down. Like, I'll, I'll feel better. You know, just I feeling off. Maybe I did too much yesterday. And um, he's like, no, I'm going to call an ambulance. This isn't normal. And I'm like, okay, I guess that's fine. <laughs> and so he called an ambulance. They came. By the time the paramedics came to get me out of our third story apartment, I had fainted again. And so I was like, okay, this said something is wrong. But again, no history of anything. No idea anything was wrong. Went into the local hospital and... I think within four hours after I arrived, I was in the operating room and they like threw iodine on me. Like it was emergency surgery. And what's wild is I didn't know what was going on. I was thinking like, oh, I'm in a hospital. This is where they fix you. Like, just keep calm, like keep Mm -hmm. it together. Yet my in-laws were there praying for me and like kissing me. Like, you know, are you, you know, we're here. We're going to make sure you're okay. I didn't know that the cardiologist had told my husband, like, her chances aren't good. Now, again, in hindsight, I had a one to three percent chance of living, which was not what I knew at the time. At the time, I'm like, I'm here. They're going to fix it. It'll be fine. I woke up the next day. And again, my blood pressure, it was like 45 beats per minute. See, I don't know know the technical terms for anything, but it was very low. And it was to the point that they were like, we don't know if she's going to be okay going into surgery, if it's going to be, they just didn't know. And when the the surgeon came in, he was on call and he actually knew Dr. Dietz, which was really cool. Like I can, in hindsight, Mm -hmm. you see all these things come together, but he came in, he thought I was an elderly woman. He's like, what is this 28 year old doing in the ER? Like, this isn't normal. Again, I think the whole thing is like, this isn't normal. This isn't normal. So I woke up the next day. First thing I said to my husband was, do I have a badass scar? (laughs) And he's like, (laughs) oh yeah, you do. Because I didn't even know I was having open heart surgery until I woke up. Because he had the ability to like sign everything. So I didn't know what was going on until I woke up. And then uh, my the surgeon was like, okay, this isn't normal. Let's order genetic tests. And then two weeks later, I found out in the post-op meeting with the surgeon, okay, you have Lois Deed syndrome. I even have the paper where I wrote it down, spelled it wrong. Like, I was like, this is so <laughs> funny. Cause I was like, what is it again? And in that same meeting with him or post-op appointment, you know, he also was like, you know, you're going to need another open heart surgery. We just did what we had to do to fix that tear. Um, And like, this is your new normal now. And so it was a lot to process and I'm, I'm a slow processor. So for me sitting in that room, I'm just taking notes. I think Brett was processing it faster than I was because he's like, okay, now we can plan ahead. Everything's okay. And I'm like, no, it's not. This is horrible. What does that mean for like having kids or, you know, when can this be emergent again? Is this really planned ahead or is this going to be a surprise? And like, I'm 28. I don't want to be in scans and surgeries. And like, I can't imagine going through all that again. So it was definitely like, uh, I feel like my feet got kicked out from under me. And then it's like, okay, learning to walk again. But that's the aortic dissection (laughs) surprise. And what's really wild is like, again, in hindsight, my mom was like, you had all the signs. Once we knew what Lois Dietz syndrome was, I had transparent skin as a kid and still do like in my arms and like, I'm double jointed in almost every joint in my body. And like, just different things as she's like, they just didn't know what to do with it. Like you wouldn't, those things aren't life threatening, but all together creates this, you know, syndrome, this genetic condition that will affect the rest of your life. So it was really interesting to kind of see how we processed it. And then my family processed it. And then they all got genetic testing and none of them have low state syndrome or any mutation. So really wild, just a spontaneous, I'm just lucky, I guess. <laughs> yeah, the first, the first in your family. How, so this, I, there's so much to unpack there. Where in the aorta was your dissection? It was, 
I know the techno, like if I saw a picture, mm-hmm. but I could say it was the ascending. So like out of the root, but not to the branches of your carotids. Okay. There's just like a little tear. And what's wild is my surgeon was like, oh, you actually had a dissection before that looked like it healed itself. Like you have a scar on your heart. And I was like, what? And like thinking back, what's so funny is maybe three or four years before that I had fainted playing volleyball and I just totally forgot about it until because I was playing with my boss at the time. And I think she reminded me of that recently. She's like, do you remember we were playing volleyball one time you fainted and you were like, oh, this just happens sometimes. And I was like, I don't remember that at all. So I'm like, I don't what's wild. I'm like, there were signs there too, that I just didn't think anything of or like put it together. Um, but yeah, just a little tear. And then in the emergency room, I was just cold. Like I just remember being really cold because the blood wasn't circulating. It was staying yeah. all around my heart in that sack around your heart. That's so much to go through at 28. And what you know, you came out of this with all of this stuff to process. So how did you, how did you start processing that? Like, what did you focus on? That's a great question. I think at first, especially right after surgery, I was like, oh, great. I survived. Check. Surgery done. Like that was literally, I was like, cool, like fixed, no more issues. Let's move on. And then it was like a slow realization of, okay, then I found out I had Lois Dietz syndrome and this could be surgeries for life. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. So then processing that and then going through like, okay, but I'm normal. I'm okay now. So then I was kind of eager to just like get back to life. And so that was, I think that first surgery was about six months until I felt totally normal. And then I started like emotionally, I would just have like these outbursts or like, just like start crying randomly or like, and I was like, my body was processing all of that trauma that I didn't even recognize as trauma until probably a year after my surgery, a year or two. And then like mourning what I thought life would be like, like, I'm like, oh yeah, we probably won't have our own biological kids at this point or okay, this doesn't mean I have to go through a surgery again. Oh, that sucks. You know? And it really, instead of being like encouraged, like, oh, okay, I'm strong. I've got this. It was like, no, this is really unfair and really sucks. And like Mm -hmm. going through that process of like grieving the life I thought that we would have, but then also getting professional counseling and therapy to help process, like peel back those layers of an onion (laughs) that are like, yeah. And someone to just say, you know, this isn't fair. Like, yeah. why you? Why at 20 years old are you having to go through that, you know, and just process all that. And so, um, yeah, a lot of just paying attention to my body and just my emotions and my thoughts and then giving myself space just to process that or like cancel plans or be like, you know, I'm just having a rough day and letting it be rather than feeling like, oh, I've got to be so strong. I've got to power through. This is something that I can overcome. Like, no, this is something that I'm living life alongside this Mm -hmm. illness, you know, and this condition that at any time could decide like, okay, that's it. So it's really weird. It's a really weird, bizarre feeling. Yeah. What were you told about Lois Seeds when you were diagnosed? I was told that it affects all of the arteries, veins, like connective tissues in your body. And so I was like, okay, so not just the heart. And then that I need annual monitoring. So like annual scans, just to make sure, you know, think your veins and arteries are measuring okay. And so I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But then it was also like, I have the tortuosity in my neck that I never knew anything about until my surgery. And then other aneurysms to watch. So that was like kind of a lot (laughs) just figuring out like, okay, so this isn't just my heart. This could happen anywhere. And then also um, we were told that, you know, if we wanted to have biological kids, that it'd be 50% chance of each child getting it because it's autosomal dominant. (laughs) So that took me back to my like, 
high school biology days of, okay, I got to picture that chart and how that works out. But that was about it. And then we kind of, we saw like Louis Seed Center Foundation just started Googling it once they figured out how to spell it. And then just seeing like, yeah, what does this mean? And what, what does this mean for the future? Because even some things that we had read had said most people don't live past 28, that they end up taking a nap, like, oh, I'll just rest after fainting and you don't wake up. Um, So that would have definitely been my situation had Brett not called an ambulance. But it was very broad. Like it wasn't, it was specific in some ways, but I'm like, what are connective tissues? Like what, it was hard to like put tangible, what does this look like? Like, what am I looking for um, to that syndrome. Yeah. And how has that changed over time? So it's six years later. Yeah. Oh, I think um, understanding what was really interesting to me was how the different mutations present. That was really interesting to me to understand like, okay, I have, I think I have TGBR. I'm totally going to mess all these things up. So I'm sorry. Um, I think I have type two. Um, either type two or type four. And I always confuse them. And I'm sorry, I confuse them. But, you know, just seeing that like this mutation presents in different ways. And then it's also like shows up in different areas of my body. So like I have these things inside my mouth that the dentist like, oh, those are your connective tissues. And I'm like, oh, so sometimes it can be really frustrating because I feel like every time I go to the doctor, it's something else or like, Mm okay, that's connective tissue. Okay. You know, and just kind of saying like, you know, I bruise really easily, like just things that affect day to day that are more annoying, but then I'm also like, okay, but this is the body I've got. So (laughs) yeah, (laughs) try to make peace with it. And so I think being part of a community of other people who have low seat syndrome or affected by it has been really helpful nobody else really gets it. And I think that's really hard sometimes is like you explain it. And I think they have the mentality I did after my first surgery where it's like, oh, it's fixed, it's done. But it's right. like always ongoing and like not in a downer type of a way, but like it's always not something new, but it's just you're living with it forever. Like just because you have a surgery doesn't mean that it's necessarily like check, done. Um, right. That surgery is done, but the experience is not. Yes, yes. And so I think that was hard with my second surgery, an aortic root replacement, because I think people were like, oh, you've been through it before. Like, it will be fixed and done. And I'm like, yes, but (laughs) there's other (laughs) aneurysms they're watching. So it's just, yeah, it's trying to have grace. Like other people try and they try to encourage you and like, stay positive about it. And I think there's definitely this healthy tension with it that like, like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> like, yeah. I need another surgery. That sucks, you know, and just accepting that rather than like, okay, I can do this. I don't know. It's like this mix of realist, like being realistic, but also like, just like processing it. Yeah. It's a hard thing to, to live with. So I don't, I don't have Lois D's, but I have feds and I think that yeah. they're, you know, fairly similar and that I have those days where I'm like, man, this really sucks. Mm -hmm. Like it really, really sucks. And then other days I'm like, everything's great. Everything's great. Don't have to think about it. Everything's fine. (laughs) I'm just going to move forward. And then sometimes, you know, things just kind of hit you out of nowhere and you're just like, well, well, this sucks. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just this like back and forth, just trying to deal with it. How long did you get in between your aortic dissection and your aortic root replacement? Mm -hmm. Well, originally I was told it'd probably be within six months that I would need surgery. And I was like, no, (laughs) like, please (laughs) no. And especially it's like, you don't know what you have to go through until you go through it. But what's interesting is the surgeon basically told me like, you know, let's wait till the swelling goes down, the stress on your heart goes down, then we'll have a good baseline. So I was like, okay. So it was uh, my first, my aortic dissection was December, 2017. And then my aortic root replacement was March, 2021. So about four years, 
three years, something like that. So yeah, once they scanned and then it was like, okay, it's not changing much. I mean, that was cause for celebration (laughs) just to be like, okay, I don't have to really think about it, you know, but of course you always have precautions and have to be careful. But yeah, I think the days where it's like, okay, I'm not thinking about it are good days. And like, okay, I'm just going to keep on keeping on. But I will say having a planned surgery was way, the recovery time was better. It was definitely tougher leading up to surgery because you know what you have to go through. But recovery was like three months compared to six months. So um, that was being preventative or proactive was way better. (laughs) Yeah, that's, I think Shireen Shalhoub has talked a lot about the benefits of like planned surgeries with conditions like these where like you know ahead of time going in and the surgeons know ahead of time going in and just how much that improves your potential outcomes right you know and um but I can imagine like the mental toll that it takes like knowing okay this is coming up yeah 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 and feeling like especially running my own business is like, okay, how do I prepare for that? And we work with incredible clients who are like, take the time you need. Just let us know when you're easing back in, like just incredible people. So I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Let's talk about your business. You mentioned that you had your own business before your diagnosis, right? Is it the same one that you have now? And like, how did you go about starting your own business? And then how has it (laughs) worked Uh, with... You having that, yes. So I'm a graphic designer and studied fine art in college and then actually went into advertising and graphic design and art direction that route. And so I never thought I would own my own business. I was happy being a freelancer, working with anybody and everybody. So I was freelancing full time uh, after I got married, actually shortly before, because I wanted the flexibility (laughs) to like work from home and do my own thing way pre pandemic. So I, started that just was doing my own thing doing odd jobs freelance design jobs and then after my aortic dissection that was kind of a wake-up call of like okay i want my work to mean more than just freelancing and working with anybody and everybody and so i actually transitioned to only working with nonprofits, and so that was really uh, where i met you actually um yeah. and yeah and so just kind of built that and as I got more nonprofit clients. I would, you know, let go of small business clients or odd jobs that I just kind of took to help pay the bills. But yeah. And so being able to work from home, what's funny is I was like, well, maybe I'll go back to a full time job. Like, I don't want the stress. Everyone thinks, oh, working for yourself is amazing. And there's so many perks, but it's a lot more stress and it's hard to disconnect at the end of the day. So it's like, You're always on, always thinking about it and obsessing about your work. (laughs) Um, But after my second surgery, my husband was like, you know, I don't think like not that I couldn't go back to a full time job, like being able to take a day and rest or build my own schedule or say no to clients or deadlines that like, you know, I can't take on that stress anymore. And so it's really given me a lot of freedom and like the ability to flex and kind of flow with how things are going. But then there's also the times that st- like, it's like, okay, I have to take three to six months off for surgery and recovery. What is that going to be like? <laughs> so yeah. like making sure that planning ahead and then getting back up or getting other designers who can help me has been really critical. But that flexibility and being able to be honest with myself, like I always like overachieving and like hitting the deadlines and like doing a good job. And so kind of allowing myself the grace too to like, okay, I'm not feeling good today or I have a migraine or I've got auras, you know, like just different things that inhibit my ability to work. And being able to say like, okay, I can't work today, but I need to just push everything else or build in margin so that if I'm having a bad physical or mental health day, like I can take that time and it's not going to totally mess up my timeline. So yeah, like operating like a normal person (laughs) or like having a normal boundaries compared to wanting to do all the things and 
constantly overachieve and push and like stress myself out. Yeah. That's so awesome that you have that flexibility. Did, was your business name always Heart Spark? Did that come oh, it wasn't. from this? Okay. Yeah. I'm so curious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's Heart Spark Design. And so it was originally Lauren Nicole Creative. And then when after my first surgery, I transitioned it to Pen and Promise Design Studio. And then after my was it after my first surgery, I knew I was gonna go all in on nonprofit design work and branding. And so I actually worked with a branding studio, a naming studio out of Minneapolis, and they came up with Heart Spark. And I was like, that's perfect. It's perfect. And so it was funny because they showed me five different options. And then the fifth option, I was like, that's it. Like, I just knew like, yep, that's it. And so, yeah, so it was after surgery, but still very fitting and perfect for what we do. It's so perfect. It's so perfect. Yeah. So I know that um, a little while ago, I guess, I don't know how long ago it was. I think at the time of this interview goes live, it'll probably be like three months or four months since you had appendicitis. Yes. Do you want to talk about the appendicitis and the surgery and that experience? Yeah. Yeah. So again, like once you're kind of in those days where it's okay, I'm not thinking about it. Like I'm doing good. Like I'm ready to actually the day before I was like, okay, time to like buckle up a little bit and start eating a little healthier and get back into my walk routines, like all the things to be healthy. And then it was a Monday morning and I'm sitting on the couch and I'm like, I have this pain in my side. And I'm like, that's weird. And as you know, I'm sure any pain or discomfort or anything, even yesterday I had this weird ache and I was like, what is that? Like, you're just way more aware of like, that's a new feeling in my body. Something is something wrong or is this just a muscle ache or who knows? And so I was sitting at home, ate breakfast and I was like, okay, this is a weird aching pain. And like, it's not going away. It's in my right side. So, of course, I start Googling. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, appendicitis could also be, I forget what else came up. But, of course, it's like the end of the world, you know, right. type of diagnosis. And so, I um, went and talked to my husband. I was just like, hey, just want to let you know, I've got this weird ache. It's not really going away. It's like a dull ache. But I don't know what to do with it. You know, like, I'll kind of keep an eye on it. And he's like, okay, well, let me know. Long story short, we went to the ER and then there's this whole other stress of like, okay, this hospital by no fault of their own, but like they don't know what Lois Deed syndrome is. The surgeon doesn't know what it is. So we're waiting like all day and you're just kind of waiting for tests to come back, getting scanned, going through the hole. And like, they're like, are you claustrophobic? Ask all this question. I was like, nope, I'm good. I'm good. You know, and um, they're like, okay, it is appendicitis. We're going to need to take it out, obviously. But of course, then we're like, okay, well, what is that? You know, I have Lois Deed syndrome. So you need to be careful around arteries or like big, you know, blood vessels, all of those things like this could end up being a very complicated appendectomy, but we don't know. It should be fine. And so just talking through that and trying to process that and also like, is this worth the risk? Right. Okay. Yes. This needs to come out. And so just go weighing all that out. And especially for something in my mind, as minor as an appendectomy, I'm like, okay, this is nothing like open heart surgery yet. So I'm like, okay, I'll bounce back. I'll recover quickly. Like Mm -hmm. A surgery went fine. Everything was great. But in and out in a couple hours, then like, yeah. okay, head home. <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? This is so wild. Get home. And of course, I'm like, okay, this should be like a day or two. This shouldn't be right. a big recovery. But I had to keep reminding myself, like, any recovery is complicated with this condition. It just takes time and like the emotional toll of like, really, like everything's going perfectly great. Right. And then appendicitis. All right, cool. You know, so it just has this like, I was really frustrated and angry, honestly. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'm here on the couch. Let's just rest. So I kind of just leaned into it. I was like, we're just going to be lazy. I'm just going to enjoy 
<laughs> this recovery time. <laughs> and then a couple of days after I was home, I actually ended up with shingles on my left arm. So it was just one thing after another. And it's times yeah. like that, that I'm just like, okay, I'm going to take the pressure off of myself. We're just going to be, I'm just here. <laughs> Like yeah. my body needs to recover. I need to get back to normal, but it doesn't need to happen right this second. And so it's really humbling to go through surgeries and then this process and then another surgery or a p- surprise procedure or something else happens or after you go to the doctor, you find out something else. And so it's just, it can be really exhausting. And I think that's where in the past I used to be like, okay, I I can do it. Like I'll make it through like just like optimistic attitude, which you can do. Maybe that works for some people, but at a certain point, it just is like just addressing the fact that it sucks. Like, okay. And also like, you know, there's a lifetime of this. And so how do I choose to recover well and do it well rather than being frustrated or angry. So it's just like balancing all these things and kind of knowing when you need to give yourself some tough love and like, okay, get up, Mm -hmm. get moving, start, you know, do your daily walk. And then times where it's like, you know what, I just need to feel this right now and just cry and scream and be mad, (laughs) like throw a tantrum, you know, because it's like, if you don't, it's like there's so many things that are out of your control with this condition that it's like it's like this constant balance of okay I can't control that but I can choose to take care of myself do things to help my body but then there's times like I want ice cream I want what I want like that's okay too you know it is yeah yeah you have to do I love that what you said there was so important it's like if you're looking ahead at a lifetime of this like potential for an event here, an event there, and, and another one here, and maybe not, maybe none of that, right? But mm-hmm. the potential is there that you have to look ahead and think, how can I prepare myself and take care of myself through what's probably or might not be one thing? Right. And it's... Another thing that really struck me when you were talking was the, the like, oh, well, it's just appendicitis, <laughs> you know, and I, I find that so relatable because when you're used to dealing with these, not even used to, but when you have dealt with these major life-threatening events in aortic dissection where your survival chances were not as high as one would like them to be. And you have all these risks for all these other things that are like life-threatening things. Right. And appendicitis, I'm pretty sure, is a life-threatening thing, right? <laughs> but it just feels so much less. And yeah. I find that really striking because with these conditions, like we're constantly having to deal with more. And so those kinds yeah. of run-of-the-mill things that are life-threatening and feel like really, really major to somebody that doesn't have one of these conditions can feel like a really just, eh, that's appendicitis. My <laughs> and then it hits you later. My with me with his feet up. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, this is nothing. And I'm like, I know, but <laughs> I was the same way. I'm like, you know, okay, this isn't as major. It doesn't mean it isn't major, but it just, right. it's a different perspective. And I will say like, that's one thing, one of many things with Louis seed syndrome that makes me so thankful for it. And like having gone through surgeries, it's like, you know, you really know how to help people who are going through the tough stuff. I say like, they're going through a shit storm. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. you really you know how to speak to that and encourage them and just be with them and not feel like you have to solve it or like have all the answers because we don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's been such a gift is to like process one, all of our bodies deteriorate and like go through similar things as we age, but to understand that early, but then also to walk through tough stuff with friends who 
are going through horrible things. That's like being able to feel more comfortable with that and not saying it's perfect, but there's just a different perspective that comes, I think, with these connective tissue conditions or genetic mutations that like is literally in your DNA, yet there's nothing, there's only certain things I can do to control it. And so it's really interesting how that changes your perspective. And I just think, you know, that's really a superpower is being able to sit with people and have that grace for yourself and understanding for yourself. And like everyone will go through body deterioration, loss, surgeries, and then to see that as a younger person and be able to understand that. I really admire kids who find out they have Lois Deed syndrome young. And I'm like, wow, to have that level of preparation and support and understanding at an even younger age is really remarkable to me. And like all of the kids that I met with Lois Deed syndrome and um, Marfan syndrome is and VEDS is, you know, really, they're just like unflappable and very realistic. Like, I don't want to say they're like super optimistic and easygoing, but it's just like, I don't know, it's just a different perspective. So I think that's kind of the positive side to it, maybe. (laughs) It's um, just different level of empathy and perspective and understanding that many people will live their whole lives and never experience that. So there's Mm -hmm. definitely some positives, definitely some negatives, but, um, you know, it really is an interesting journey and not one I ever thought would affect me at 28. Yeah, for sure. So one of the other things that you mentioned a little while back in our conversation was going to the ER and knowing that the the medical professionals there, they don't really know what Lois Dietz is. And, you know, Lois Dietz wasn't a named condition until like, what, 2003, 2004? I think. 2005. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's a relatively, unfortunately, like knowledge of a newly named medical condition doesn't get out very quick. And even though that seems like a long time ago, like I recognize that's almost 20 years ago, it's still relatively short in the big picture of named conditions. Right. What has that been like for you? What's funny is when I first heard about Lois Deed syndrome, I assumed it was founded by someone who like a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I found out my surgeon actually knew Dr. Dietz. And I was like, wait, he's still alive? (laughs) Is what I (laughs) I responded. And that's just my, like, I just didn't know. Um, And so uh, it was for me, it didn't change too much because I was like, okay, this is already discovered and founded and like, I'm able to say, like, I have low ACE syndrome. What's interesting to me is that they're still studying the genetics of it and, like, being able to test for a specific strain of, you know, mutation and, like, genetic code that I'm like, wait, they're still discovering this. I think in my mind, I'm like, oh, this was founded a long time ago and they've known about it. Like, medical discoveries are still being made all the time. So I think that's what makes me most excited is maybe in the future, everyone will have genetic testing and know what they have or, or not have, you know, and kind of have that knowledge ahead. Or maybe there will be another treatment for open heart surgery that's not totally opening you up, you know, or, you know, a different procedure, different ways to fix or solve things. So that's what's exciting to me is that this is discovered. And now there can be like, dollars, but behind researching it or just trying to make it better for the next generation. Because I don't like that the solution is, okay, we're just going to cut you open and fix it. <laughs> it's not very uh, encouraging <laughs> to someone yeah, with a it. Crude solution. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. What do you, for medical professionals listening to the show who are just learning about Louis seats, what do you want them to know about it? Hmm. I think the the doctors that I've experienced and like I appreciate most are the ones who are asking like, how am I doing? It's not just how I'm feeling or like any new aches or pains or little things. It's like they're paying attention to my whole being 
including my cardiologist who, you know, she's like, you know, how are you doing with your mental health? How are you walking every day? Like asking questions that are not just physical health, but she knows that, that if they all affect each other. And so I think paying attention to the whole person, but then also like recommending, like feeling, feeling empowered to like, push back. Like, so my cardiologist, I was like, okay, I'm feeling good on my medication. I'm doing good. And she's like, we won't, you know, raise your dosage if we, if you don't feel comfortable. So for a while I was like, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel comfortable. And then it hit a point that I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to start increasing because it can cause you to be tired or lethargic or like just different side effects that I wasn't quite ready for. I'm like, I feel steady. I want to stay steady. So I appreciate the like, my doctors respect that. And then also are like, okay, but if we increase this dosage, it'll help you in the long run, or we're doing everything we can to help your aneurysms stay the size they are. So I think knowing those options, and then also just encouraging your patients along the way, not just taking no for an answer, but really working together to figure out what's best for you right now. And really, for me, it was like, I don't want to raise the dosage because I feel good. I don't want to have to think about it or worry about being tired or, you know, I'll hit a point where I'm ready for it, but not right now. (laughs) So I would say, you know, seeing the whole person and really building a plan together has been really encouraging to me and helps me feel like there's some control. So much of this condition is like things are out of your control or you're being told you need surgery or need this or need that. So being able to have some effect on your health or say in your health is really helpful. And I think really builds trust. For sure. It's that partnership attitude mm-hmm. towards healthcare. Yeah. And if somebody's listening to this who is just diagnosed with Lois Dietz or is going through what you did in 2017, mm-hmm. what would you tell them? I would say there can be a lot of information and overwhelm, but like, stay, I think, stay in the day to day, like one thing at a time, one day at a time. And then if you're like, like I was reacting really outside of my character, like there were things that I was just crying about, or I was angry, like from zero to a hundred. And I'm like, that is not my character or how I normally respond. Like pay attention to those signs because then getting therapy or counseling or help to process that is critical. I don't think I would be in as healthy of a place as I am today without going through a professional psychiatrist to walk me through what I'm dealing with and that it was trauma. And I didn't really recognize that that was trauma until years after my surgery. And I'm like, oh, that's surgical trauma. That's why I like my blood pressure rises every time I go to the hospital. And I just, I have to build extra space around appointments just to like come down from that, even at just a typical doctor's appointment. It's like just extra space. So really paying attention to what you need and what's going to be best for you and then getting help when you need it. And you'll know when it's time (laughs) when you need it. Yeah. I think that's wonderful advice. Truly. Thank you so much for coming onto the show and sharing your experience. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share so much. I feel like this is a good conversation and I hope it helps someone and knowing that the signs are different in men and women for aortic dissection and being new with low seed syndrome I hope that more people continue to realize that's what they have earlier than later in life for sure or a surprise like I had for sure I think that's one of the most um I don't want to say exciting things about children getting diagnosed earlier because it's not exciting to have children <laughs> diagnosed right. with these conditions, right? right. But it's ho- it's kind of hopeful knowing that they know earlier and yeah. know, you know, can grow up knowing the signs of what to look out for and being cared for by the medical system yeah. kind of before. Yeah. Absolutely. It's so yeah. important. I'm very very I'm very much looking forward to hopefully within my lifetime being able to see the difference and, you know, where these kids are today at my age. Absolutely. Yeah. 30 years from now. 
I really hope more research and more studies are being done and genetic testing for everyone. Like we have the answers right there and it's just a matter of discovering them. So yeah, within our lifetime, let's say that manifest and bring it about <laughs> new existence. Yes. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to this episode featuring Lauren Atherton sharing her story with Lois Steet syndrome. If you're ready to meet others, get involved, or need support, check out the episode show notes for some helpful links. There's also a link in the episode show notes for the VEDS Collaborative Natural History Study, a research study led by Dr. Shireen Shalhoub, open to people with VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and similar connective tissue conditions. On the next episode, we'll be talking to Liam Nelson about his story with Marfan syndrome. If you like this show, be sure to share it on social media, and you can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon. As always, my top tier patrons are listed in the episode show notes. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.